So this is really uh, uh, me musing really on, on why we do this stuff and trying to come up with a justification for uh, the approaches that we've taken uh, both in the CRM and the CRM or how are we going to exploit this in the future. So it's, it's, it's a personal vision rather than a, a, a CRM SIG vision but you can make of it as you will. So uh, recently, Hort Love May et al. Uh, did a short paper in January this year, No Future in Our Heritage Management. Uh, and they had surveyed a number of professionals from different nationalities and tried to understand what concept of future were people using. And the conclusion that they drew was nobody knew. Right? So all of our legislation, all of our guidance documents talk about preserving for the future, either by preserving by record or by preserving in the, in the field, uh, and for the future. But we've got no idea, as a discipline, what the future is. Um, so what it ends up being is a continuous rolling present. So we're preserving things as they are now for the future, which will be now, but in the future. This seemed rather disappointing to me. So <clears throat> I um, thought about why do I think we do this stuff? Rather than preserving it for the future, I thought maybe the purpose we had was to understand the present by understanding how we got here. So identity is usually thought of as being, you are the sum of all the things that have ever happened to you. So if you don't know what's happened to you, <coughs> like bits of last night, for instance, um, we, we have no present. We don't know where we are. And so if we're creating a future, the past must necessarily help the process because it informs our present because we're setting off from now, our identity now, and projecting forwards, and we only know where we are now if we know our past. So presumably, the role of cultural heritage is to gift people their past, so that they understand who they are, their present, they have an identity. So that was a sort of kicking off point for me to muse a bit more. Um, one of the problems that, uh, George alluded to is that archaeologists will never agree on what they should record. Right? It's the old, we've got three archaeologists in the room, how many opinions are there about the archaeology? At least four. Right? Um, and we don't want to fossilise the discipline. If we say this is the way we'll record, that's the end of the discipline. We're going to go nowhere because <clears throat> we end up being, you know, the 21st century was the end of archaeology. There was no, no further development. So we don't want to do those. So trying to regulate documentation is a completely fruitless task. What we need to do is provide the sorts of mechanisms that allow us to combine data that has been recorded in different ways, using different paradigms, using different methodologies, and make that available so that people understand what was meant rather than having to immerse themselves in the data. I, I remember um, back in the uh, 80s sitting with an archaeologist who was employed to write up a site that he had never seen. And in fact, there was nobody in the unit who'd ever seen the site. We just had a big box of paper and a lot of pottery. You know, the usual shit that you pick up, right? Uh, and it took him 18 months to even get a handle on what was going on in this excavation report. So the idea of reusing excavation data, if it's going to take you 18 months to get a handle on each report that you want to start to incorporate the data in, it's, it scales like a bag of bolts. Nobody's going to be able to do it. You'll be able to do two, and then somebody's going to want you to produce some results. Now, 10 years ago, this month, uh, I wrote this really nifty short titled paper uh, and presented it at a conference in Athens. Um, 
And it, part of what we were talking about there is how do you link different um, sets of data, different data silos, and we were decrying the, um, the crosswalk methodology, which was quite common. So I'll map to you, and you'll map to him, and I'll map to him. Uh, which, again, doesn't scale well. When you get to the 1500th database, you've now got to produce 1500 crosswalks. So one of the things about the CRM is the idea that we try and build this lingua franca so that we can move across. So we have uh, canoes, I thought that was, <coughs> they carry a payload, uh, it goes in one direction, uh, and we comp I compared it with, with bridges, which are bidirectional, uh, and produ produce continuous feed. And I was thinking that bridges were better. That was the contention 10 years ago. Now, <clears throat> perhaps we can treat the future as another data island, that we're going to transmit data to it by a, a mechanism, whether it's a canoe, or we bundle it up and throw it, or whether we have a bridge. So we prepare our data so that it can be used in the future in a way which will be useful. Uh, what about the bi-directional bit? Uh, uh, of course, all archaeologists should immediately go out and spend all of their spare time inventing a time machine, because that would solve an awful lot of problems. Uh, <clears throat> but the key message of Holt of May as well, was that we're going to hopefully move towards constructing the desired future from now, using the past to inform the decisions we want to make. And they, they're pointing at a number of pieces of interesting work where the future is being constructed by using cultural heritage as part of the mechanism to build a future which is desirable. Now, so that might be something that's interesting. But now it's time to get a little bit existential. Uh, <coughs> so uh, John Paul Sartre's Boots Closer, No Exit, um, where hell is other people or listening to a lecture by me. Um, <laughs> uh, and one of the things that happens in No Exit is that the protagonists who are trapped in hell can see back to their previous life while people remember them. And it's stuck with me for a long time. It's surely what we want to do is be remembered so that we can look back for all the things that we've done. So. If we create a legacy, have some tangible impact on the future, perhaps we will be able to, be, to see that. It's a bit weird. And, uh, I'm not all wishing you all dead, but uh, we, may be, we want to be remembered for something that we've contributed. Um, Jean-Claude Gardin suggested that inference chains is a way forward for us to encapsulate the knowledge that we generate so that it's actually consumable, because monographs are too big and too static. You know, you produce a monograph, at some point, the conclusions that you've drawn in it will no longer be valid, and nobody's going to read it anyway. There's, there's too many of them. You know? Have you read every monograph in your area that's been produced this year? No. You, you don't have time. It would take you. It's, it's like my daughter trying to watch YouTube. Mm -hmm. they, they upload 140 hours of minutes into YouTube, and she's trying to watch it all. It doesn't work. Right? So um, CRM Inf and CRM Archeo are designed to enable this idea of inference chains, where the high-level constructs that you build, the conclusions that you draw, can be backtracked into the underlying data, so that we see where we want to see the detail down to this piece of rock was found in this hole with this piece of rock, or pottery, or whatever. So I think that the really, this is the only slide that we see around, so, um, the really important thing is that the CRM Archeo makes a real break from recording stratigraphic relationships as the primary record. And it talks about the physical world, and then it draws conclusions from it. And it makes that link between 
what we saw and what we thought it meant explicit and separates them out. So now we have a mechanism for transmitting what we saw and what we thought about it at the end of the trail to the next generation, no matter which methodology we used for excavating. Whether we did it in spits or we did it in single context planning mode or whatever. So data for the future, um, first of all, we need to ensure its quality. So make sure that the data is internally consistent. Maybe that means fit for purpose, but as we don't know what the purpose is, at least make it so that it stands up by itself. That would be good, please. Right? Uh, make it portable, so map it to the CRM so that other people can consume it, because they then don't have to learn how you structured your data. They only have to learn how to see or out. You map it, so you are expressing your thoughts the exact way that you want your material to be consumed into something that everybody can then consume. And so for long-term usefulness, we need it to be explicit, and we need to record the empirical provenance of the data we're generating. How did I do it? So the so-called paradata needs to be embedded in the data. I'm sure many of you have heard my horror story about the Southampton Pottery Database, where <clears throat> after 30 years, the Pottery Database was still perfectly usable, but the code book that allowed you to understand its meaning no longer existed. Right? So if you don't have the metadata and the paradata embedded in the data, which the CRM does for us automatically, it provides that mechanism, that carrying capacity, um, then the chances of them getting divorced and dying is quite high. So what can CDOT do about this? Well, obviously, it's the home of the CRM family. Uh, we're going to provide access to best practice. We can produce or validate content standards so the things that you're putting in are valid, are about the right things, so recording things. But that's the communities of use thing, not the standard. Uh, we want explicit intended and practical scopes, which is a revelation once you start doing that properly. It completely changes the way you build standards. Uh, and we provide, and we already do provide, the mechanism for empirical provenance within all the standards of the CDOC family, the CRM family. However, there is one standard everybody must obey. You have to be explicit. Or, So, <clears throat> let us hope we can be remembered for our data rather than meet the devil. Right, thank you very much.